I'm the one missionary who didn't leave to Ed's chagrin. I'm still here. <laughs> Speaking of missionaries, I saw the Pattons, didn't I? Yeah. Andy? All right, Andy and Carol Patton, Peru. <laughs> How long are you folks in town? <laughs> Middle of September. Okay, so talk to them. They're on the front lines. Serving the Lord, when, wait a minute, how long have you been now this term? Three or four years? How long ago? Three years. Seems like yesterday. All right. Well, it's my privilege to share with you this morning. I get Memorial Day often. I think it's because everybody goes on vacation. Pastor Kevin's on vacation. Pastor Steve's in Spain. Pastor Jim is preaching to the little people. Um, I think it was two years ago. It might have been as many as three. I was selected not just to preach, but for a job that I believe I am imminently qualified for. I was to be the judge in the dessert contest. <laughs> oh yeah, I got skills in that area. <laughs> However, it didn't happen. Our eldest Ryan concussed himself. Is that a verb, concussed? After church, and so we had to go to the hospital. So I missed out. I'm not bitter, I'm just saying. So, so anyone that would like to resubmit and be rejudged, I'll be glad to accept, and I'm sure we can make you a winner if you'd like to be one. So <laughs> anyhow, I uh, returned a couple of weeks ago from a whirlwind tour to uh, Europe and to Africa. I hadn't been in Europe. I was in uh, Ireland in 1994. I'd never been to Africa before. Our organization, Good News Jail and Prison Ministry, placed chaplains in jails and prisons around the world. And uh, the Lord has allowed us the opportunity to minister in about 100 facilities here in the U.S. through the ministry of 77 chaplains in 22 states. And then overseas, we have chaplains in 25 countries serving there. Faith Community Church supports us. We thank you for that. Faith Community Church has supported our chaplains here in Ar Anne Arundel County since our chaplains began, I think, almost 30 years ago. So we praise the Lord for your faithfulness. So you were involved with this organization long before I was. But I want to give you a brief update of what I did. I uh, met with our national directors in Lithuania. They came from Russia, Latvia. Our Estonian director was not there, Kyrgyzstan, and the Ukraine. And uh, so they, each of these individuals, typically pastors a church, but then ministers in their prison. I want to talk about Pavel. There, Pavel is our director in the Ukraine. Been ministering in prisons for many, many years. As a matter of fact, if you look at this picture, this is one of his volunteer teams. All of these gentlemen, once upon a time, were prisoners. And now they're volunteers sharing the gospel in prison. Each year, Pavel has a gathering at his house, and more than 100 former inmates come to celebrate what God has done in their lives. Uh... Not only were they inmates, but upon their release, almost every one of them lived at Pavel's house for some period of time. Uh, got so friendly with them, you see his three daughters, two of them married former inmates, one of them is now a pastor. So that's what God does in the hearts and lives of inmates when he changes them. You know, our media, <laughs> praise the Lord, amen. We don't hear a whole lot more about the invasion of the Ukraine by Russia but the war between those two countries continues to rage. In the last three years, over 10,000 Ukrainian soldiers have been killed. That's more than double the number of allied forces killed in Iraq and Afghanistan in the last 13 years. So, difficult circumstances, but God is at work. I let, traveled from there to Rwanda, and by the way, it's not direct. You kind of have to go through some other countries to get there. I'd never been to Rwanda, uh, and uh, our African, or excuse me, our Ugandan director, who's actually right smack in the middle with the blue tie, his name's Alonai. Alonai on Sunday welcomed us to non-Africa. He, from uh, neighboring Uganda, had never been to Rwanda in his life. He says, I come to Rwanda, Kigali. He says, this is not like Africa. This is clean. <laughs> and uh, that's true. Now, the reason Kigali is so clean is because after the genocide in 1994, when the United States and other countries stood by as a million people were slaughtered, all of a sudden the West came to their rescue a little bit late. And so there's a lot of investment in Rwanda today. Uh, but the interest, in ministering, the interest in ministering to inmates is low 
in Rwanda, among other countries. Why? Because most of those in prison, 77,000 inmates, are there because of crimes that they committed during the genocide. One quarter of the population was wiped out in 100 days. So needless to say, when that happens, virtually no one in the country is not touched in some way uh, by that. So God's doing a great work among inmates, but he's actually doing an amazing work among our chaplains because among our 13 chaplains, every one of them has ministered to someone in prison who's responsible for the death of an immediate family member. Now, if that's not the mercy of God, I don't know what one is. That wall there is part of the memorial that they have now to the genocide. April 7th of each year, Rwanda begins a 100-day period of mourning to remember the genocide, hoping never to see it repeated. Matter of fact, this year we launched a new project called the Rwanda Mercy Mattress Project. What the project does is it uh, provides mattresses for inmates who otherwise would be sleeping on concrete and dirt floors. But the funds go to manufacture the mattresses, and those that are doing the work are widows and orphans who have no skills and are victims or have suffered because of the genocide. So as a three-pronged effect, we impact inmates with the gospel. Each mattress has Bible verses printed on them. Employment for widows and orphans, opportunity for chaplains to take the gospel in. So for $30, you can buy a mattress and know that the gospel will go to an inmate and provide basic needs for those that are creating them. This weekend, we celebrate Memorial Day, tribute to those that have sacrificed, remembering those that have given their lives on our behalf. While I was in Africa, I met um, Peter Masabi Kahingu. He's our director in Kenya. He's the guy on the right. Um, <laughs> in case you couldn't tell, you know, sometimes it's hard to tell who's who. So Peter walks with a very distinct limp. You could tell he has a knee problem. So while we were waiting for a meeting, I asked Peter, I said, Peter, what happened to your knee? And everybody in the room just kind of rolled their eyes as if they've heard this story before, but I'd never heard it. So Peter told me his story. I want to share it with you, my version of it. Peter enlisted in the army, served for four years in the Kenyan army, and then he was accused of espionage, accused of being a spy for Tanzania. He was imprisoned for six years. It was a case of mistaken identity. Peter was then released after six years, and he went to the authorities to demand reparations. He wanted to be repaid for the six years that he'd wasted in prison, and as he put it, he says, I probably went about it the wrong way. The result of his confrontation with the authorities was not reparations, but a new warrant set out for his arrest. And Peter Masabi Kahingu was declared public enemy number one in Kenya. He was recaptured and then shot attempting to escape the source of his knee problem. So here's Peter in solitary confinement, chained to two guards. Another inmate comes in and begins scrubbing the floor. And the, and the inmate who's scrubbing the floor is singing and being joyful. And Peter said, how in the world can you be singing and be joyful in this spot? And the inmate said, it's because of the joy of the Lord. To which Peter took his breakfast, lunch, or dinner, whatever it was, and threw it in the other guy's face, angry with him. Time passed. Peter was still in solitary confinement. No one was permitted to see Peter. Peter is being prepared to go before the judge awaiting sentencing for this set of crimes, neither of which had he committed. This inmate asked to see him, and the guards told him no. But not accepting no for an answer, this is what the inmate told the, the guards. He said, this man is going before the judge. If you do not allow me to speak to him, and he ends up in hell, God is going to hold you accountable, and his sin will be on your head. They let him go in. <laughs> and this inmate witnessed to Peter, and Peter gave his life to Christ, but then Peter was sentenced to 134 years in prison. Another six years passed, the Supreme Court finally reviewed his case and exonerated him. Matter of fact, the other day I Googled it and I found it, and you can read it on KenyanLaw.com. You can read the case from 1993. So Peter left prison in 1993, 
became a street preacher and a pastor. In 2001, he became our director of Good News Kenya, reaching inmates in the country of Kenya. Goodnewsjail.org. Since we did RideForLifeMD.org, I might as well do goodnewsjail.org too. You can find more about our ministry. Glad to share that with you. Reminders. They can be of good things, things we'd like to remember, and they can be of bad things, things we wish we could forget. We're going to the book of 2 Peter. 2 Peter. So if you start at the back of the Bible, work your way forward. About six or seven books. You come to two books, 1 and 2 Peter, written by the apostle or the disciple Peter, writing to the same group of people each time. Now, having looked at these books and having spoken this morning earlier in the first service, these are pretty depressing books. I just want to warn you. So hopefully we'll trust the Lord to encourage us. Chapter 3 of 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 1, how do you know that this is the same group of people? Well, he tells us, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. Well, what's the reminder? Well, In the rest of this chapter, there are a number of, I'll say, popular verses from the scriptures that if I'd asked you before this service, most of you, including myself, probably wouldn't have known they came from 2 Peter. Verse 8, but beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to this, these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. Now, why this message? Why this looking to the future, looking to a new heaven, looking to a new earth? Well, if you look at 1 Peter, you'll see that these believers, they're Christians, have been scattered. They've been tortured. They've been abused for their faith, persecuted. Flip to 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 4, one book back. Verse 12, Peter writes this, Beloved, don't think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake in Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of God and for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. Let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. You know, every time I hear a preacher say, I really believe that God just wants us to be happy. He just wants us to be prosperous. He just wants us to enjoy the riches that he's provided to us. I turn and I ask, is that true for an orphan in Sierra Leone whose parents have died from AIDS or Ebola? And then I turn to this book, 1 Peter, and I say, that's not what this book teaches. It says that life may be miserable. But it points to the fact that life is temporary on this planet. And that our real salvation may not be experienced until we're in glory. But Peter says, that's okay. You just keep pressing on. Because God wants to use you. I think at times, we like to fight it. We try to fix everything. And we get miserable. We get frustrated. So Peter's guidance, he says, don't fight it. Submit to the Lord. Commit yourself to Christ and you'll see that salvation come because it only comes from God. So that's the backdrop for these books, right? Not real encouraging, but there's much to be learned. So then Peter writes the second book. Let's go back to 2 Peter chapter 1. And in this book, he speaks over and over again about our forgetfulness, about how we don't remember very well. 
beginning in verse five, second Peter one, but also for this reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Verse 10, therefore brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it's right as long as I'm in this tent, this body, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off this tent just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Peter understands human nature. 90% of what you hear, you forget how quickly? Three days, okay? And for those of us who don't listen very well, I bet it's a whole lot quicker. Yeah? That's the way we are. We forget stuff. We are people who forget. My sister-in-law used to describe my older brother Chuck this way. She says, I send him to the ATM to get $40. He comes back with 20 bucks and a big gulp, and he doesn't know where the rest went. Do you know anybody like that? (laughs) Or this person, talking on my cell phone, and as is my habit, I pat my pockets to make sure I got my wallet, got my keys, Everything in their respective place. So yes, while talking on the phone, I start freaking out, wondering where my phone is. You ever been there? (laughs) Or this guy. So he left work, big downtown city, took the train home for the weekend, gets to his stop and discovered no car. He'd driven to work that day. So now I gotta get back on the train, go back home. So a 30 minute commute is now a three hour ordeal. Is that you? (laughs) Or this guy, lost his driver's license, looking around the house for it, found the old one. Said, well, put that in his pocket. About an hour later, thinks, I found it, only to discover it was the old one, still hasn't found the new one. I know a retired naval aviator who, when he wants to remember something, he takes off his wedding ring and he moves it to his right hand. It sounds ingenious, but my fear is I don't think I'd remember what I was supposed to remember. I don't think that would work for me. So we get the picture. Peter did too. We forget a lot. So he says in verse 12, let me remind you of something even though I already know you know it. And then in verse 13 he says, I'm gonna keep reminding you of this so long as I live. And then verse 15, I wanna make sure you remember it even after I'm dead. Sounds like a parent, doesn't it? Right? We just keep repeating it. So what is it that we need to remember? What's so important that Peter thinks, I'm gonna tell you what you already know, I'm gonna remind you as long as I live, and I'm gonna keep reminding you even after I'm dead. What is it? Go back to verse five. Let's go through this list again. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness love. Quite the list. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I like the way the New American Standard puts it. It says, for if these, verse eight, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you're a grammarian, an English professor of sorts, or aspire to be one, you know that a double negative in English I don't think is very good, right? We're not supposed to use those. But in the Greek language, and this is all I know about Greek, all right, so don't ask me anything further. When there's a double, Remember Jesus used to say truly, truly, okay? When there's a double, it's an emphasis, all right? It doesn't negate itself, it's a point of emphasis. So Peter's saying, I really, 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 really want you to listen because I think God has a real plan for you, a usefulness for you, a purpose for you if you're willing to listen and respond to this challenge. Again, the list, start in verse five, apply diligence, Add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness love. 
For if these things are yours and abound, you'll be neither barren nor unfruitful. A fruit tree that produces no fruit is just pretty to look at, isn't it? It's not of a whole lot of value. So, first thing to remember, God's challenging us. He's challenging us. Well, challenge us to what? Well, I think the real challenge here is to put forth a little effort. The Apostle Paul often draws a, draws a comparison between our spiritual lives, our spiritual fitness, and physical fitness. And I think the reality is, is that we're either improving or we're digressing. There's no middle ground. Standing in the middle doesn't really work. We're not standing still. We're either reaching up spiritually through the things of God or we're slipping back into the things of the world. We're on a slope. And so we're either climbing or we're sliding. It's very difficult to remain in one place. So Peter understands this and so he gives us an action. He says the word giving, which means to apply, giving all diligence. This is the idea of grabbing something aggressively, running alongside of it, grabbing it, tucking it and running with it. That's what he's challenging us to do. Lock in with diligence intensity. And then he says, do this. What do you need to do intensely? He says, add to your faith virtue. Now, we don't want to be misunderstand what we're adding to our faith. The issue here is not salvation. The issue here really is our survival. Salvation comes through faith alone. There's no effort that you or I could do that could improve upon the free gift of eternal life. So the effort that Peter's calling for presumes that faith is already evident, that faith is already present. The work of salvation is already accomplished, but the value of that salvation in terms of life here on earth is diminished if there's not a diligence of effort on our part. So Peter says, add to your faith virtue. What is virtue? Well, virtue is maintaining the course. It's following the command. It's not being distracted from whatever the commitment is. You're called to it, you stick to it. So the one who is virtuous is one who's sold out to following the command, following the request following the direction. To this, he says, add knowledge, knowledge of the Holy One, knowledge of God, the knowledge of his word. Time for our checkup. Who got more time this week, God or ESPN? Who got more time this week, God or HGTV? Who got more time this week, God or Facebook? Yes, I am meddling. But that's what Peter's saying, your usefulness. Our usefulness for God's purposes is predicated upon our relationship to the word of God and our relationship to the living word, Jesus Christ. So that would be enough for a sermon, wouldn't it? But he keeps going. And he says, now add self-control, ouch. Ouch isn't in there, by the way. That's my word. So where does self-control get you? Time? I'm the biggest time western waster in the world. I'm really, really good at it. That's my other skill. Dessert and time wasting. I'm really good at those two things, right? Is it your finances? Is it your emotions? Is it your anger? Peter says, apply diligence. Get on it. Start working. And if that weren't enough, then he adds perseverance. I think perseverance may be the hardest of all because perseverance has to do with enduring even when it's not going well. Hanging in there when things are miserable. There are certain people in life, and I've already cleared this, but Carrie Alishire is one of these people. Just happy all the time. Every time you see him, it's just, right? <laughs> Bless you, Carrie. But sometimes those people are annoying, aren't they? I mean, it's just too much. Now, I told her I would say that, so don't anybody get offended on her behalf, okay? She's okay. But they just are. They're looking at the bright side. They can always see the silver lining. And then there are the Eeyores among us. I've been called a wet blanket, and I can't understand why. <laughs> Eeyores aren't happy unless they're miserable, right? Their greatest joy in life is having something to complain about. 
real downers to be around. They always see the dark side. Perseverance, however, is neither of these. It's not about being and seeing the bright side. It's not about just looking at the light side of life. For Dave Cole, a little head jiggle just isn't enough to make you happy. I've learned that perseverance requires a diligence in prayer. Three things that I think are the prayer of perseverance. Number one, pray for God to show you what he spared you from. It's kind of like a prayer of thanksgiving. Thankful that it's not worse than it is. You know, 99.9% of the time, it could be worse. You may not feel that, you may not sense that, but it could be a whole lot worse. So pray that God would show you what he spared you from, what he's prevented and protected you from. Secondly, in the prayer of perseverance, pray for God to show you what he wants to teach you. What am I learning through this? Because if I'm not learning, I'm probably not paying attention. Each episode of life presents opportunity to learn, to draw near to God. Often it forces us there. We can look for the opportunity to learn or we can just miss it. What may be powerful lessons. You hate to waste them. Third thing to pray is pray that God will show you a glimpse of how he could use this in the future, particularly in the life of somebody else. I can point to many points in my life, things that I've had to go through that the Lord has used in the future to help me to understand so that I might be able to help somebody else. Now, I'm often quick to say, I wouldn't trade the learning for anything, but I wish there was another way to learn it. All right, what does that mean? I wish there was an easier way. I would have taken the easier route. But most hard things don't come easy, do they? It takes a lot of pain to get there. So praying for perseverance, not just surviving, but surviving and enduring with God's perspective, that God's at work, not just talking about a positive attitude. Lord, I've seen what you've given me. I'm not even sure I like it, but I'm gonna be content with it and trust that you're gonna work out whatever it is you're going to do in my life. I think that's perseverance. To this we add godliness. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness is the commitment to walk with God, to look at life from God's perspective and be obedient to the things that we know to be right. To this then add brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness add love. Love is last, but it probably may be the most important. Our love for God is manifested in our love for others. You can't really do one without the other, can you? All these things that he's just laid out for us, they're, they're obstacles, they're barriers, they're choices that we really have an opportunity to make. Diligence, perseverance, self-control. Sure, in pure form they come from, from God, but we have to be willing. These are acts of our wills or signs of our submission yielding to God and his work. So why would we do this? I mean, why would we do these things? Well, what's the motive? Verse nine, so 2 Peter chapter one, verse nine, he says, for he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Our second reminder is that God's changed us. I think Peter is uniquely qualified to remind us of this. Just before Christ went to the cross, Peter said to Jesus, everybody else may abandon you, Lord, but I won't. And I think in that moment, Peter forgot that he was a sinner. He forgot that he was susceptible to sin. He forgot that his natural tendency, his natural wiring, was to do and be disobedient. And as a result, he denied Christ three times. I don't condemn him for his sin, It's just he seemed a little bit boastful to suggest that that would never happen to him. So when he reminds us that um, God has done a pretty powerful work in our lives and we need to remember that, I think he's qualified to say so. 
God has transformed our lives, but maybe we've forgotten that. A blind person can't see anything, by definition, right? But a short-sighted person only looks at their moment. They could possibly see more, but they refuse to. They don't look forward, they don't look back, they just look at where they are right now. Now, I'm not against the moment or living in the moment. Um, I don't really know what that is. Some of you do, so maybe you can explain it to me. I think you get the idea. Often a person, though, who lives in the moment gets really frustrated because it never works out quite how you planned it. It never works out quite how you imagined it, and the buildup is so great, there's no possibility that reality could fulfill the dream that we create, and we get discouraged. But Peter says that we all tend to be short-sighted in our own way. Spiritually, we've forgotten what sin did to us or what sin does to us, and we forget that we no longer are obligated to continue in sin. We've been changed, and so now we have a choice. Remember that God's changed us. He's given us a choice, challenged us to walk with him. Third thing, remember that God called us. Verse 10, therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. Those of us who know Christ, we've been singled out. Why exactly? I have no idea. Why did God pick me? I don't know. Why did he choose you? I don't know. Garrison Keillor recalls the childhood pain of being, of picking teams. Maybe you recall this. Particularly baseball. He says the captains are down to their last grudging choices. A slow kid to play catcher and a kid to stick out in right field where they never hit the ball. They choose the last ones two at a time, you and you, because it doesn't make any difference. And the remaining kids, the scrubs, the excess, they deal for us like we're handicaps. Ah, well, if I take him, you got to take him. That's kind of how it goes. Sometimes, he says, I go as high as sixth, usually lower. But just once, I'd like Daryl to pick me first and say, him, I want him, the skinny kid with the glasses and the black shoes. Come on but I've never been chosen with much enthusiasm. But God chose you. He gave his son for you. I'd say that's a pretty reasonable level of enthusiasm. And so we have the honor of belonging to him. He's given us a free gift. It's called salvation. And so this is our calling. This is our purpose. Why exactly God called us I have no idea. But when you have the honor of being chosen, I think it's it's our responsibility then to take advantage of that. So Peter wants us to remember the challenge that there's a level of effort that we need to put forth if God's going to use us. Remember that he changed us and that he's called us for that purpose to be useful. Let's say that one of your children, let's pick a teenager, they've got reasonable skills, pick a sport, so they're on the team. They make the team, got a uniform, they're in the club, they're a member, but then they practice, they don't really practice. They don't really participate, they don't work with the team, they don't listen to the instructions, they don't learn the plays, they just pretty much do their own thing day after day, practice after practice. Then comes the game time. They got the uniform on. They think they're ready to be in the game. But they don't play a whole lot because they haven't really practiced a whole lot. And even when they get into the game, they kind of blow it. It's a little embarrassing. It's embarrassing for them, embarrassing for you. Whole family's embarrassed. They don't even know what to do. Every time the ball comes to them, they just get burned. So your kid comes home from this experience and declares that he or she hates the sport. Hate the coach, hate the team, nobody likes them. Got no friends, they just want to quit. I'm no good, they don't need me. So I think a typical parent would say something like this, well, how in the world do you expect to be a valuable part of the team or enjoy playing the game if you haven't really put forth any effort? You haven't bothered to learn the plays, you haven't tried to improve at all. You've just been happy to have a uniform. 
think that's our challenge. Whether that's a good analogy or not, I don't know. But having the uniforms neat. But why bother if we're not going to put forth the effort? So the choice is ours. Peter says, God can make you very useful, very productive, very fruitful, but there is a level of effort that you've got to put forth, a diligence to pursue things that God prizes highly, godliness, love, contentment, not being short-sighted and focusing on ourselves and on our moment, but seeing what God wants to accomplish in our lives, seeing what he wants to do. If you just sit on the sidelines, you may be left wondering, why should I bother? And I agree with you. I'm not sure why you would. So if we step back for a second, we might refine those last two points. Remember that this is why God changed us, so that we might be useful. This is why God called us in his infinite wisdom to be used by him. And so our challenge is to be diligent, to put forth the effort to serve him. On Memorial Day, we use the word sacrifice to reflect and remember those that have died so that we might be free. So I offer you this quote in closing that applies really to our spiritual lives, but uses that word sacrifice. A sacrifice to be real must cost, must hurt, and must empty ourselves. Give yourself fully to God. He will use you to accomplish great things on this condition that you believe much more in his love than in your weakness. May we remember today the challenge that God wants to use us. Let's pray. Lord, it can be a sobering thought. It can even be a discouraging thought that living in a world full of sinners, living and walking in obedience to you, may not be a life of happiness, may actually at times be very, very hard. but you've designed us in such a way that when we're fulfilling your purposes and we're pursuing the things that are important to you, that somehow, some way, the song says the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace. So our challenge this morning, Lord, is to remember what you've brought us from Remember what you're preparing us for. And remember that you have a great work that you want to do through us if we'll just commit ourselves to following you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.